I'd like to call this meeting to order uh, for uh, December the 11th, 2018. Sorry for the delay, but we've been over on the Tennessee side with the uh, meeting that they have going on over there. And we wanted to set in on that for a little bit. Uh, anyway, the mayor will not be here for a while. He's expected to show up at some point in time, but we don't know when, so you're stuck with me until then. So just bear with us. Uh, if you would, take a minute and join me in a moment of silence. If you would, stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Uh, comments from the city manager, mayor, and council meeting. I'm sorry, mayor and council comments. I, well, probably like everyone else, I'd just like to thank uh, everyone that helped this past weekend with the snow. Uh, the fire department, police department, um, public works, especially getting the roads clean, but especially what y'all did to try to help people that were stranded along. Interstate 81, uh, you know, it's um, unusual for us to get snow this big and this early, but I think everyone stepped up and did what, what needed to be done. And uh, I just want to say thank you. I'd like to echo um, Mr. Hartley's comments. It's, uh, it's not often that we get this kind of weather and we handled it as best we could and, uh, and all of our departments did a, did a really good job. Um, and in addition to that, I'd also kind of playing off this meeting we just came from with uh, the Tennessee City Council and uh, hearing about the trauma changes from ballot. I think it's an important subject that we all do our research on and do our homework on. And you know, if you have any thoughts one way or the other, you should you know, reach out to ballot and let them know and because they're the ones at the end of the day who will make the decision. So certainly do your homework on that and, and, and let them know what you think about it because it's, uh, it's a big thing that could affect all of us. Uh, I was going to say something similar to what Mr. Hartley was saying about uh, snowfall and all the guys that worked hard to get the roads cleared and open again. Um, there may still be some slick spots out there, but after 48 hours after that big snow, most roads I've been on in the city are perfectly fine. So, you know, hats off to all those guys that have been working hard the last couple of days. Okay. Comments of the mayor? I mean, the city manager? Sure. Uh, council, first I want to uh, make an apology to Gene Christian. Uh, at the last meeting, I forgot to amount the amount of time that he had put in and helping with the Christmas tree uh, and getting that decorated again. I think he put on a whole new set of lights, I believe, maybe. And uh, so tree looks great. And, I'll, you know, I apologize for not mentioning that last time, Gene. But thanks for doing that. Uh, secondly, just like council has mentioned tonight, uh, this past Sunday, the city had a significant snow event uh, that broke snowfall records, especially this uh, early in the winter. Our streets and maintenance department has done an outstanding job in getting the roads in drivable conditions. These folks have worked tirelessly for the past two days to get the job done, and they should be commended. I understand there are still some minor issues on some of the city roads, but we have to remember we received approximately a foot of snow in a very short time period on Sunday, and cleaning up this amount of snowfall takes time. We've received uh, several complaints over the past few days and concerns from citizens in regards to snow removal. And um, what I want citizens to understand, there is a priority level of how we get to roads. Uh, and our primary roads are always going to get the first attention. And that includes roads like Lee Highway, Gate City Highway, Commonwealth Avenue and Old Airport Road, Euclid Avenue and State Streets. And then we continue to work on the secondary roads and then even uh, further tertiary roads after that. There is a, uh, on our city's website, there is a snow removal map as to how the city uh, goes about removing snow from streets. So I'd encourage individuals who have questions to go to uh, the public works page and then under street maintenance, you will see the snow removal map. We're working on updating that to make it a little more easier for citizens to get to. Uh, quite honestly, even though they were calling for the, as much snow as they were, um, Often I take that with a grain of salt because it never hits like 
they say it's going to, but if we do have another uh, snowfall predicted like this, uh, I'll make sure that the map is uploaded to the city's homepage. That way citizens can take a look at that. We've also received some complaints in regards to uh, the snow as it's being plowed as blocking driveways. Unfortunately, there's no other easy way to plow snow. When you plow the road, the snow is going to accumulate in front of the driveway entrances and it's impractical for cities, uh, the snow plows to stop what they're doing, lift the plow, miss a driveway, put it back down again. That really doesn't do us any good and that's just an unfortunate part of snow that we have to deal with. Um, once again, Sunday evening, uh, late Sunday night, we had the incident on the interstate and um, the team came together at approximately 10 o'clock that night, um, did an outstanding job, got the interstate cleaned up in about two and a half hours and traffic was moving after it had been at a standstill for seven hours. So and that all goes out to the public works crew. It wouldn't have happened without those guys. So uh, overall, I think we weathered the event uh, well, we can always do better, and we're looking at ways to improve, and we'll continue to do so. All right, thank you. And with the mayor's arrival, I'm going to hand the <laughs> gavel back to him. He's awful quick getting rid of that thing. And <laughs> we're on item C. He made me talk forever till you got here. He said, "Don't shut up till he comes in." <laughs> Would you tell him what I told you this morning at Mayor's Coffee when the school system's on a delay? I want to be on delay. What the heck? Do I have to give eight o'clock this morning. All right. So item C. So we're ready to go on to uh, not. Uh, Members of the public, non-agenda items, do we have a list? Okay. Got one person signed up, uh, but you're item six, right, Michael? So nobody signed up for this item. Mm-hmm. My mic not on? Oh, well, there it is. Okay. Is it on now? Okay. Uh, one thing I'd like to uh, remind everybody is the final presentation for the economic uh, impact study for passenger rail is tomorrow night uh, from 6 to 7 at the Bristol Hotel in the Shelby room and uh, if anybody would like to attend that that would be great the more the merrier it will be live streamed but uh, we would like to see everybody that feels like uh, that that's something important to to be there and show their support okay all right anything else anything from council all right all right, regular agenda items. Uh, first item, presentation from Bristol Chamber of Commerce. Members of Council, I'm Beth Reinhart with the Bristol Chamber of Commerce. Um, we appreciate the time on the agenda tonight. We have a consultants in here uh, with us tonight from out of town, so we wanted to use their timely arrival to be able to present you all with where we are on our visioning process. Um, as you've probably read and know a little bit about for, from uh, the survey and other opportunities to provide input, we have embarked on, a group of us have embarked on a visioning process for Bristol, and that means all of Bristol. Um, and we've done that in the footprint of the region um, because anything that we do is relative to our bigger footprint. We don't exist in a bubble. And in doing so, we've coined the visioning process Bristol 2040. Um, there is a website, www.bristol2040.com, where there's a survey, but there's also, and that survey ends this week, I believe. Um, but that, that website in itself will provide all of the updates on what's happening with regard to that process. So it's a great place to keep updated on reports that come about, the work that's being done by our consultants, and Without further ado, I just wanted you all to know kind of the history of how we got here. Um, Bill Hartley is on our steering committee, was one of the initial drivers, along with Chad Keen from Bristol, Tennessee. It's when they were both mayors. And this uh, idea came about to really start a new process. We haven't done a true visioning economic uh, development strategy since the early 90s, and that was a group, um, a grassroots effort called Ignite. Some of you all may remember some of the projects that came out of that. So. We felt like it was important to begin that process. It is community and business led. Um, and the reason for that is because we wanted the community to own that and to support it and all the decisions that are made. But of course the councils are gonna be an integral part of 
how that gets implemented on the back side. So without further ado, I want to introduce Alex Perlstein, who's Vice President, and Renata Robinson, who is uh, Research Manager, both from Market Street Services, and they're going to give you a high level of the process so we don't take too much of your time. Um, and I will, apologize, I will apologize in advance. We are going to probably leave after we finish any questions or other you may have. Um, we have an early visioning committee meeting tomorrow morning to still prepare for, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Good evening. Good evening. I have multiple times made the mistake, it's not working, and then turn it on. So <laughs> that is always my first step. Uh, as Beth said, I'm Alex Perlstein. I'm Vice President with Market Street Services with Renata Robinson, Research Manager. We're an Atlanta-based firm, uh, the, the number one firm in the country that's focused solely on working with communities on these processes, economic workforce uh, and community development processes. We have been around since 1997, founded by a man named Mac Holliday, who was the only man to serve as the uh, leader of economic development departments for three states. And he says he worked for enough governors and he decided to uh, start Market Street in 1997. And over that time, we've worked in over 34 states, uh, 100 and 65 communities. Myself, I've been with Market Street for over 15 years, and I'm, I'm up to about uh, 15 states and 30 communities, I believe. Uh, these are the, the current projects that we're working on in addition to Bristol. Uh, we've had kind of a run of college towns recently. Uh, we're kind of working our way through the Big 12 and the SEC, <laughs> slowly but surely. So we're in Bryan College Station, uh, Gainesville, uh, just finishing up in, in Wichita. And so, um, you know, the benefit to us is that we just get perspectives from lots of different communities, all different sizes, uh, all across the country. So we're able to kind of apply uh, those learnings and those perspectives to, to every project. As Beth said, I'm just going to give you a, a super high uh, overview of the process Bristol 2020 that we began about two months uh, or so ago. It's, it's roughly an eight, eight month process. We're on the first box now, the competitive assessment and scorecards. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of public input. There's still more to do. We're working with the steering committee. As Beth mentioned, here's the folks on that list. They're also on the website if this is a little hard to read. And I'll give you that website address in, in just a second. But as Beth said, it's, it's a good public-private mix. Uh, some really top leaders um, in the meeting that we've already had. They really had some interesting perspectives about the community and about its past and future. Uh, the folks in bold type are the chairs of the committee. So there are three tri-chairs of the committee. And their role is really to kind of serve as the eyes and ears of the community, kind of a sounding board. Uh, to make sure that uh, the research is on the mark, that eventually it, it translates into actionable strategies. We really don't move on in the process until we get their confirmation that, that we're good to go. So, uh, you know, we have them for about two hours in meetings, but they've also committed to spending some time with the reports prior to the meeting to prepare some, some thoughts and comments. So, uh, as I said, we've already had uh, one meeting. We meet with them again tomorrow, and we're going to talk about some initial findings um, of the first report. We, uh, I mentioned the stakeholder input. We, we did over a dozen one-on-one -on -one interviews. We did focus groups with a number of different constituencies, uh, young professionals, uh, elected officials, city staff, uh, economic development folks, entrepreneurs, uh, industry. And uh, the online survey to date has received about 550 responses, which is, which is very strong. And this is just a example of uh, a word cloud that we often kind of build from the surveys and the, the number of times a word is mentioned corresponds to how big it is uh, in, in the graphic. So in this particular community, you can see what the issues were, downtown, traffic, roads. It's probably Austin, <laughs> uh, where we've worked uh, a few times. Um, this is the website that Beth mentioned uh, where you can find the, the steering committee roster, contact information for Beth and myself. Uh, where you can access the survey and where you'll be able to access the reports. Once they're approved by the steering committee, we'll post them up there so anyone who's interested in the process can go onto the website and read through the reports and contact Beth or myself with questions. So we really want it to be kind of a resource 
for anyone who's interested in, in the process. The first, the first piece of research is really kind of looking at, as, as Beth mentioned, we're, what we're calling the Bristol area, which is inclusive of Sullivan County, Bristol, Virginia, Washington County, and uh, Bristol, Tennessee, um, to, to kind of approximate a labor shed or, or you know, uh, a community as a site selector or economic development prospect would, would uh, look at it quantitatively. So we do a lot of research in terms of numbers and trends, but also incorporate the, the uh, public input. We compared the Bristol area to three communities uh, in, in the assessment, and we really kind of worked uh, with Beth for uh, a number of weeks to, to try to get to some communities that were representative in terms of population and certain other dynamics. There's no perfect uh, comparison area, but um, they're providing some, some interesting context for the data. We also compared um, all the indicators to, to the two states and to the nation, and um, as we'll discuss with the steering committee tomorrow, we kind of present it in the context of narratives and stories of, of uh, trends that, that are occurring in the, in the region and kind of the implications of those for economic growth. Um, this is an eye test, so we, we're going we're gonna to test you on the, it's both an eye test, and color, and numbers. Uh, this is an example of a scorecard that's also included in, in the report. This is not from Bristol, this is from another community, but we have uh, five different scorecards that look at quality of life, a number of indicators, uh, business trends, uh, workforce, um, and we're in, in these scorecards we, we're comparing the Bristol area to nine other places. So the three uh, communities in the report plus six other comparison areas, Lynchburg is in there, I think Richmond is in there, Asheville is in there, so it just no provides, reason. what's that? No reason. Roanoke. Oh, Roanoke, I'm sorry, I got my R's mixed up. Um, but again, it just provides a lot of interesting data that kind of speaks to uh, what's occurred in this community in the, in the last number of years. The, the next uh, report looks at target sectors. So it looks at different uh, segments of the economy that, that really have benefit to create uh, good paying jobs here, sustainable uh, growth. So we're going to be looking in a lot of kind of wonky detail into the uh, economy of the Bristol area. So we not only look at the kind of top level sectors like manufacturing, but we'll look at multiple kind of subcategories of manufacturing to see if there are some opportunities there um, that would warrant economic development investment. Um, and that's where we're also going to kind of bring in a broader perspective of, of the Tri-Cities metropolitan area, understanding that labor sheds um, very often are 30 to 45 minute drive time. So when uh, site consultants are looking at communities, they'll kind of put a pin on a map and then determine the labor shed. And that's kind of um, the geography they use to assess uh, locations for investment. The other uh, component of that report is going to be looking at how the community is marketed. So we'll be looking at CVB, we'll be looking at tourism, we'll be looking at uh, networks, uh, which is the economic development marketing entity on the Tennessee side and also the equivalent on the Virginia side, just to get a sense for how the community is promoted for the purposes of economic development. Uh, those two research pieces really feed into the strategy, which uh, tries to answer the question of what does this community need to do to be most competitive for jobs and talent and investment. It will both incorporate the, the quantitative research but also qualitative. We um, have asked Beth for any existing plans or strategies or reports, so we want to kind of capture the existing activity, jump on the moving train um, here. And, uh, you know, we're going to work multiple times with the steering committee to make sure that we've got a plan that's aspirational but realistic and, and actionable. And last but not least, maybe mo most important, is the, the implementation plan, which kind of takes the what of the strategy and determines how it's going to be implemented. So this is where we'll look at uh, capacity to implement, whether it's personnel, uh, budget. We'll look at who does what, you know, who owns what activities, what, who supports other activities, uh, what does, you know, what do you implement first, what kind of do you uh, implement further down the line? We'll present benchmarks and measures, so how are you going to uh, estimate progress and track progress? And this really serves as kind of the operational plan to put the uh, strategy into motion. So with that, um, interested in any questions or comments or thoughts that you might have for us?
tonight? Yeah, I had a couple questions. Mm -hmm. One, have you ever uh, done this process on a city that's across the state line? Uh, we worked in Kansas City. <laughs> and uh, that, uh, we worked for the city of Kansas City, uh, Missouri. But when we were doing that process, Kansas had just basically eliminated uh, uh, taxes for small businesses. So there was a huge concern that all small businesses would just kind of make a mad rush to the other side of the border. Um, and, you know, they have a, kind of a famous border war uh, in terms of economic development, attracting companies, spending millions of dollars to attract companies, sometimes half a mile, um, just to kind of claim them. So we've got that experience. We've worked in Charlotte. We've worked in uh, Memphis, which shares actually borders with two states. Uh, we worked in the Quad Cities in uh, Illinois and Iowa, which is actually five cities. <laughs> Um, but that is, you know, you've got Illinois, which was bankrupt at the time and, and um, you know, wondering how they're going to keep the lights on. And then you've got Iowa, which was a very strong and competitive and they had uh, firms kind of migrating from Illinois to Iowa and talent. So, yeah, it's something that we see quite a bit. There's no easy solution. But. Well, I think for me, it'll be interesting to see how you uh, uncover what's really different between two sides because the tax structure is different. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lots of... Uh, uh, laws that are different about different establishments on one side yeah. versus the other. So how you reconcile uh, whether those are positives or have to be resolved somehow through some kind of a joint effort. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for me, I'm, I'm looking for a lot of joint facilitation out of this. I think this will be the first time we've had, you know, both sides of the city, both counties that, you know, really have kind of a focus uh, thing to talk about. And, and so how, how are you going to... Um, I'm sure these go perfectly smooth, right? You have no oh, yeah. disagreement ever. No, no, okay. <laughs> so how, how do you deal with the, um, those disagreements? What's the process of kind of mm -hmm. uh, talking through all that? Because there's going to be, I can see quite a few sure. with all the uh, government entities involved. Well, first of all, um, you know, we've already heard a lot of great ideas from folks. And, uh, you know, very often these strategies really come from uh, people's vision and we just kind of take what we heard and, and put it in the form of a, of a strategic plan. But, um, you know, I think that you have examples of, of projects that have seen bi-state collaboration, whether it's the birthplace of Country Music Museum or the library, and people, you know, this is really top of mind for folks, and, and they are quick to kind of say, hey, you know, we've, we've kind of um, been able to come together before, and so it's thinking about, you know, what those opportunities might be moving forward strategically. And then it's really about kind of building uh, an implementation kind of network, uh, building teams that come together to move forward specific strategies. And, and I would envision that these would be kind of have representation from, from both states and from private sector and public sector uh, community organizations. So it's really about the implementation and ensuring that there's converse, that you, you create context for conversation. Um, It'll be interesting to me how that how that progresses because I think there's going to be a lot of discussion mm -hmm. here because we're pulling in um, folks of municipalities that have never really talked about this before. So it's going to be interesting to see yeah. how that. I mean, goes. I think what's interesting is that. So I wish you luck mm -hmm. on that. <laughs> um, if you need any help, I'm sure Randy will give you all the Absolutely. guidance. Absolutely. No, we got him on uh, speed dial. Two quick ones: <laughs> is does the website have a way for citizens can still give you input or ideas? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, my contact information and is there in the back, so they can just there. say whatever they want, and it comes right to my inbox. And do you have a date or a deliverable kind of already, uh, in general terms, set up? Uh, for the for the first uh, report, mm -hmm. um, it'll probably be posted. You know, we're we're meeting to discuss it um, the first time tomorrow. It's still very much a draft. And there's always kind of a, a couple weeks of back and forth to get it uh, adjusted. So I would probably estimate that uh, early next year we'll have it posted. Okay. But um, you know, there we uh, have outreach to the media to promote the survey and to kind of introduce the process. And we'll um, come back to the media and talk about some of the findings. And it's an opportunity for uh, another um, you know series of articles. And so. I believe that it will also be kind of put out in the public as well. Since we just put our uh, marketing video stuff together, Randy, I think it'd be a, I think it'd be good if they looked at it and just um, you know kind of gave some critique of what we've got together about what they're thinking. That'd be that'd be good input. Mm -hmm. 
Bill, do you have something? I, I don't really have a question. It's more of a comment, having been involved in, in on the steering committee. I just, one, uh, I noticed you said the words process over and over, and just uh, want to make sure people understand that, that this is an ongoing process, and there'll be plenty of opportunities. Not all, there already has been, as you pointed out with the survey, but for uh, members of the community to get involved, because that's really what drives this. It's, it's community driven. Um, a lot of good, you know, I know the focus groups you had, uh, a lot of different interests, small business, different people like that. But that, that's what will really make this great. And kind of to your point about the marketing video, I think it comes at a good time where we're talking about working collaboratively with whether it be Bristol, Tennessee or Washington County, uh, you know, uh, our own, how we tell our story and stuff that that's one part of a larger whole for the region. And I think, you know, as people begin to talk more and more about uh, working collaboratively as a region, we need to have our part so that our voice in, in Bristol, Virginia, Bristol, Tennessee doesn't get lost in those larger discussions of what we do for a region. And uh, the last point I'd mention is, again, the, these, you know, when you get to the end and, and the actionable items, I mean, this is a long-term vision. It's things that be done over time, but how do we get from where we are today to where we wanna be? And uh, already having looked at some of the preliminary data that will be talked about tomorrow, I can see, you know, areas that, that we need to work on and things that we're doing right. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit of both, but uh, just like as, as Beth mentioned, when this process was done 20 years ago, there were some good outcomes that come mm -hmm. out of that. So hopefully uh, we'll see the same here. Good. So I did have a, uh, I had a couple of questions about the survey. Mm -hmm. So did you say it'd be done in a couple of weeks? Um, it's been available for three weeks and it'll go through the end of this week. Through the end of this week? Yeah. So how many, do you know how many people have responded so far or, or how are you getting it out there for people to yeah, take we've it? We've had about 560 so far. Uh, we've had uh, mentions in the press and um, you know, Beth, I know she can maybe speak more specifically to it, but has reached out to partners across uh, the community to send uh, you know, information about the survey. I think we've had a bunch of uh, high school students take it, but it really is just trying to, you know, social media, mm -hmm. um, very often they'll kind of get viral and someone will take it and send it to people they know. But um, it's been so far representative, I think well representative of uh, both Bristol, Tennessee and Virginia and, and the counties and we've got a good kind of age mix. Um, so I th you know, we're, we're happy with uh, the response rate we've had so far. Okay, well that's good. I'm glad to hear that there's been some high school people take it because if we're talking 2040, these are people who are going to be adults then and it's going to affect yeah. them directly and I'm frankly just interested to see how the word cloud turns out because they're cool <laughs> they're, they're cool to look at but it's a it's a it's a good illustrative view of what people are actually talking about and kind of like that example one yeah. I would assume a lot of those things would pop up on ours downtown public transportation infrastructure I saw Bentonville up there I don't think that'll pop up on ours. oh well then I guess that was Benton <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think it, I think it'll be a good good illustration of what people are actually talking about and what the buzzwords are absolutely All right, thank you. Well, thank, thank you so you. much for your time. Stay tuned. <clears throat> yes, thank you for the time, and we certainly hope uh, to keep you all updated. Bristol, Tennessee has asked that I come to their work session every couple of months just to keep them updated on what, uh, what's out there and what's been updated on the website. I'm happy to do that at whatever uh, regularity you all would wish, or Bill can keep you up to date as well. So just let me know how we can keep you posted. Thank you. Thank you for the time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next item, consider public hearing of an ordinance 18-14 to amend the city charter. I hereby open the hearing. Staff report. Council, Council this is um, some new amendments to the charter that have been proposed that was left out in the previous uh, charter amendment that we had proposed at the last meeting. So there are several changes. All of these have been discussed in some uh, form or fashion, either on October 23rd or November 13th, or either on two on two meetings with council. A public hearing was advertised on December 3rd and the 10th. Um, and at this time I would, well, I can't do that at this point. That's just a public hearing, so that's it. Okay. 
All right, uh, no one signed up for this um, item on public comment. So I hereby close the hearing. So on item three, consider first reading of ordinance 18-14 to amend the city charter by caption only, staff report. Uh, council, once again, this is uh, just in regards to the public hearing that we had in regards to changes in several sections of the charter, uh, mainly section 405 under mayor and vice mayor, section 5.03 under uh, general powers and duties of the city manager, and section 7.04 with the police department. And at this time, I would request the uh, council to approve uh, the first reading of this ordinance. Okay, seeing no one signed up for public comment, uh, what's the pleasure of council? Uh, move to approve. We got a motion of Mr. Osborne to approve. Second. We have a second, Mr. Hartley. Council discussion? <clears throat> okay. Please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. Reading of the ordinance, caption only. I skipped ahead. Oops, sorry. An ordinance to request a charter change to the charter for the city of Bristol, Virginia. Okay, now item four, consider second reading and adoption of an ordinance to exchange parcels of land with American Merchant by caption only. Staff report. Uh, the city of Bristol, Virginia entered into a grant agreement with the Appalachian Regional Commission to provide grant funding for the installation of a critical wastewater pretreatment facility to be located at 750 Old Abingdon Highway, the property which was acquired by American Merchant. Per the grant agreement, the wastewater pretreatment facility must be located on publicly owned land and be owned by, the public in by a public entity. This will facilitate the swap of small parcels of land identical in size to be transferred between the city of Bristol and American Merchant to meet the terms of the grant agreement. It was a public hearing and the first reading was held on uh, November 27, 2018. All right, seeing no one I'd also like to mm -hmm. add, until we get the deed from uh, American Merchant, uh, I, won't, I don't want you to execute any deeds. I haven't prepared those for you yet. All right, seeing no one signed up for this item, we move on to council motion and second. I move to approve the second reading of the ordinance by caption only. Okay, motion Mr. Osborne. Second. Second Mr. Hartley, council discussion. All right, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. Reading of the ordinance, caption only. I keep skipping ahead. Ordinance to transfer surplus city property. All right, now I need a motion and a second to adopt the ordinance. Move to adopt the ordinance. Motion, Mr. Osborne. A second. Second, Mr. Farnham. Any other discussion? Okay. Please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. All right. Item five, consider second reading and adoption of an ordinance 18-13 to amend the city charter by caption only, staff report. Uh, council, uh, these um, are charter changes that were discussed previously on October 23rd and November 13th. A summary of possible changes was provided to the public uh, in the November 13th agenda packet. The public hearing was advertised on the 19th and 26th of November and the full text of the proposed changes was made available to the public and posted to the city website. Uh, these changes pertain to several uh, portions in our charter, uh, mainly section 2.06, 3.05, 4.03, 4.07, 5.01, 5.02, 7.02, 7.03, 7.07, 7.08, 7.11, and 15.03. Okay. Seeing no one signed up for this item, uh, what's the pleasure of council on this item? I move to approve the second reading of the ordinance by caption only. Okay, motion Mr. Osborne to approve 1813 by caption only. I'll second. Second Mr. Farnham. Any discussion? All right, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. Reading of the ordinance, caption only. 
an ordinance to request a charter change to the charter for the city of Bristol, Virginia. We now need a motion to adopt the ordinance. Move to adopt the ordinance. Okay, motion Mr. Osborne. Uh, second. Second Mr. Farnham. Please call the roll. Farnham. Yes. Hartley. Yes. Osborne. Yes. Wingard. Yes. Mumpower. Yes. All right, item six, consider approval of agreement with IGO Technology. Staff report. Mr. Mayor, members of council, this um, was brought to you, I think uh, was put on the agenda and tabled back in September. Um, it is uh, a company that provides rural um, data, like Wi-Fi access, and what they're asking for, you'll see from the photo, is um, to lease a four by four section on top of our roof to put a backhaul antenna which will shoot uh, information or data from here to a tower on top of South Holston Mountain. And uh, you should have the rental agreement in your packet. Uh, it's asking for $50 a month, or we're asking for $50 a month for them uh, to rent that spot. You'll see by the, the the photo that it is a non-penetrating roof mount. What it, they use a platform that has a non-skid bottom <coughs> and it's weighted with some type of ballast. Uh, it's a very small unit. The power and data will both come off of the transmission lines that are located at the corner of our building. Uh, we will not provide either one of those services to them. Uh, it's very low maintenance, so that doesn't seem like, you know, once that it's installed, it should, uh, the maintenance of it should be very minimal, uh, nowhere near what our HVAC unit requires. Uh, so we're hoping that uh, that this will be something that maybe we could even get more of in the future. Uh, it's not a huge amount of money, but it's, it's a little something for a, a four by four spot on top of our roof. Um, if you have any other questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Um, I think we had questions earlier, so we got one person signed up for public comment, Mr. Pollard. Thank you, gentlemen of the council. My name is Michael Pollard. I live at 101 Ashley Drive. Uh, the agenda packet had a different photo, uh, different than the one provided on the, the screen right now. Uh, I would like to, introduce, to uh, say in, uh, in introduction that Nancy Marnie gave me a call and said that she's opposed to it because she doesn't think it would look good. Um, so I did want to give her opinion on that. Uh, of course, I go on a more factual basis than, uh, than that. But uh, so uh, I would like to point out that the contract does not specify the building that this will be installed on, the address, the square footage required, the height, weight, any city design approval, or anything about required utilities, installation of privately owned utilities, which most utilities do involve some degree of damage during their installation, or any compensation for city provided utilities, which it sounds like there won't be those, uh, or anything about insurance, uh, bonding for the tenant, or liability to the tenant, or anything about a lease term uh, or rental adjustment at the end of any such term. Uh, if the information uh, provided is complete, uh, my impression is that if the proposed rental rate is appropriate, any number of private organizations should be perfectly willing to offer the space. Uh, if a valid ar argument can be made to why the city should offer this service, and space rental is itself a service, rather than this being offered by a private organization, then a number of additional elements need to be addressed in the contract. Thank you. All right, thank you. You want to address any of the Yeah, I, mean, I agree. Items? You know, this is a contract that was provided to us by the uh, IGO technology. Um, I do agree with Mr. Pollard that there are things that probably need to be addressed in this contract that have not been addressed with them that I'm aware of, unless uh, you've had some conversations with them about some of the specifics. So um, it's something that does need to be addressed, uh, and I'll be more than happy to redraft that contract to suit what I think is best for the city. Okay, any other comments from council? Uh, if you are enough comments, <coughs> or I'll wait for discussion. Okay. All right, what's the pleasure, council? I'd move to approve the agreement with IGO Technology. Okay, 
second a motion to approve. I'll second it so we can discuss this. All right, good second, Mr. Hartley. All right, now council discussion. Okay. I'm leaning more towards uh, the mindset of Mr. Pollard there. Uh, we need to keep uh, things of this nature in the private industry and not on public property. Um, I, di I didn't agree with this when it came forth the first time. <clears throat> uh, it was calling out for us to uh, one, supply power for them, and I understand tonight that you're saying that we're not going to be supplying power for them now. They're going to have their own meter. No, we've never <coughs> we've never had to supply power for them. They were always going to pull power and data from the corner. Okay, so they're going to be separate metered. Okay, but even with that being said, <coughs> I think we're uh, <coughs> opening up something that we don't really need to having uh, the private come in and start leasing rooftops of public buildings. I believe that it should stay on private property. There's plenty of tall buildings in this city that would serve even a better environment for something like that. And there's gotta be in my mind a reason why they're not going after private and it's probably because nobody's going to let them put something like that on their roof roof for fifty dollars a month and uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of this so let me ask you um i, I see no problem necessarily with you know private business you know working with government but but i guess my question is why why, why did they pick the roof one here the as reasons, opposed to a taller building or something. One of the reasons that they, they chose this was the actual line of sight that's required. A lot of the, they have this bell shaped, um, I don't know what you would call it, I guess a beam or whatever. And um, they, they went around through the city in different locations to find what would be a good line of sight. This was one of the buildings that they chose. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, they mentioned was the stability of a municipal facility as opposed to a private location. You know, the, they put something up on a private building and then, it, you know, changes ownership or, you know, something happens or the owner decides that they're going to, you know, make a change. And it's just harder for them. So this is, you know, a municipality is a little more stable. Uh, that was one of the, the comments that they made. But, you know, as far as a preference between us and, you know, a private <coughs> entity, I think that, that mainly what this boiled down to was we have the best location for line of sight. I think I would be okay, you know, working with a private company like that, but maybe like what Mr. Pollard said about changing the wording a little bit to have a little stronger wording to try to protect us a little better, maybe. Um, so, I don't know, would the, would the step be to, um, to, to vote on it now um, with changing it or, or delay voting on it until we make some changes to it and send it back to them? Well, I, I mean, I would, I'm kind of with you, Mr. Farnham. I, you know, I think the language in this needs to be, it's very, vague certain things there's certain things you'd expect in a contract that aren't there uh, you know it, i think for right now maybe we table it and direct the city manager to go back and and you know strengthen that up uh and then bring it back i don't is there there's no rush to this is there i mean we we looked at it <laughs> three looked months at, ago right and, we looked at it three months ago so no there's you know there's no rush. Yeah. I mean, I think that originally there was a rush because he was trying to beat the winter weather, but I think we've missed that window. So no, <laughs> I don't really think there's there's too much of a deadline now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I definitely would like to see those, um, some of those things that were brought up before. I mean, so that would, that would be my suggestions to maybe revise that's why I second it so we could have this discussion, but to revise the motion, just table it till those can be brought back and then we can look at it again. So the motion in the second was to uh, vote on it as it is, as it reads right now. Yeah, so, and basically so. just to get us to the discussion so yeah. we can see where we are. 
basically at this point it has to be a yes or no vote for the contract as it's presented. So can I, I'm going to go ahead can and. Can we withdraw his motion? Yeah, if you, yeah, as long as And you, then we make a motion right. to table pending right. you, you to make revisions. Right. Would that. You can actually, can we amend inside? We could, yeah, we could do that. I think you can make an amendment to the motion once you've first and seconded. In the discussion period, you should be able to amend the motion. Yeah, that's so what we need to amend the motion, how, how, what do we need to do here? Based on the conversations I've heard, you can amend the motion to basically have me redraft the contract in accordance with topics that have been discussed here tonight. So we say we'd like to amend the motion to approve it pending your contract changes? Uh, I, I or should we just table to it? Council. Just table Hon it. Honestly, guys, I think the cleanest thing to do at this point would be let's withdraw the motion, table it, and then I'll just come back with another okay. one. That, that's the cleanest way to do it. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and withdraw my motion. And I'll withdraw my second. Okay. And since we're still in discussion, I'm going to take this moment to bring this up. I, this has happened too many times in the past for us to get <clears throat> on a topic and then have to change the motion, modify the motion, or now tonight we're going to table it. We need a process in place that we can get council comments before a second, before uh, a motion and a second. According to Robert's Rules of Order, your comments come after the <coughs> motion. Is how that that's how that is uh, done in Robert's Rules of Order. Well, you remember I brought up the same thing. You know, we should have council discussion prior to the motion because a lot of the things get uh, sorted out, and we might want to table before we actually get it, to the I mean, motion. It I mean, it does create it, create, it creates I, me sitting I, here wondering what I'm that. doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we've adopted uh, I think in the back in July under the council rules. You know, we would follow Robert's, rule, Robert's rules of order, and this is how Robert's rules of order suggests a meeting be conducted. As long as we—I mean, I understand that—but as long as we can amend it or withdraw the motion, uh, th that was the whole point of second it, so we could get to the point of discussion. Yeah, I, I know. mean, uh, that you know, I wasn't ready to but right. make some modifications, but I see the point, but. As long as we can have that discussion and then get to where we need, I, I don't know, you know, if you do it before the motion or after, it just becomes a little tricky of do you withdraw the motion mm -hmm. and what does it become? Okay. So now we're at a point where we're going to vote this down and then table it? No, I with, I with, I've withdrawn my motion. You so withdraw on it? I've, or withdrew it. I've, I've pulled yeah. it back. So I'm going to go ahead and move to table it. With the city. So, so we got a motion. We've moved from the original motion. We got a motion to table. Do we have a second on yeah, the table? Yeah, with the understanding that the city manager will revise this. I'll revise this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'll while we're in that. comments again on that, <laughs> <laughs> this right here is a prime example of why this city is in the shape that it's in. Yeah. This contract is written from the party that's wanting to do business with us with no input on behalf of the city. We've got to stop that. We have to have our city attorney looking at every contract as it's being presented to this city and looking at it with the eyes of protecting the citizens of this city and sending it back to the entity or the business that is trying to do something in the city with corrections and modifications that is going to benefit the city and keep us out of harm's way going forward in the future. In my opinion, this contract should have never been handed to us. That's just my opinion. We should not be looking at this and it being one-sided. We should have sent it back. It should have been modified. It should have been a agreed upon between the city attorney with council discussion on the two on twos and stuff like that before it ever comes to a vote. I mean, <clears throat> we need cleaner stuff presented to us. 
It's another reason to have a workshop in between council yep. meetings. That's why the Tennessee side does that. We got to get. To I that. mean, workshop. We discussed the workshops last year, and um, I think it's something that would be completely beneficial. Yeah, because we can sort out a lot of. We things can sort out a lot of things. Workshop. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say before we get off the discussion was I think there's a little bit <clears throat> more to this. I think when you when you have a private ent entity that's <clears throat> picking your location, you, you gotta kind of ask why. So they're seeing a value here. They're just not. Uh, you know they're just not arbitrarily picking this so they're seeing line of sight they're seeing the mountain range they're seeing uh, so there may be more value to this than we recognize and so i would think we'd want to study this a little bit more in detail because you know technology if we can figure out ways to leverage uh, funds based on technology we ought to we ought to take the advantage of that uh, i know the state's putting together some legislation to like put advertisements on school buses as an example so we're all the time looking at ways to generate revenue. Now, <clears throat> this might be a bad example, but it, it warrants uh, looking at it at a couple different detail levels, right? Like, you know, has any other municipality done this? You know, what about New York City? What about some of the big high rises? Do they charge on just a per square foot basis? Or they charge on, on um, data, data bit count, maybe? So that could create a lot more, um, you know, revenues than just a square foot fixed charge. So if they're making, as an example, just that one antenna, they might be making a lot of money just on that one antenna, and it would cost them, let's say, to go build their own infrastructure and put a tower up somewhere. They'd have to buy the property. They'd have to put the tower in, the infrastructure. Uh, you know, it might be $150,000 before you know it, right? And so now, all of a sudden, they're wanting to use something kind of for free, let's say, because we've got it and got the right spot. So. There's value to that. So you don't sell yourself short. You kind of understand what the market will bear and then understand what the risks are. Insurance liability was a good one, I thought. So, you know, the, you know if a windstorm comes up and this thing is not, you know, weighted properly designed right and the thing flies off the roof and something happens, that's not going to be a good thing, right? So, so they would have to have some level of liability, a million-dollar uh, carrier policy or something to go along with it. So... Those were all good points, I think, but I think uh, before we get even to the contract stage, we kind of talk about the business side in a little bit more detail to see if, uh, if, if everything is making sense and we're getting the best value we can out of every opportunity, or is it just something we say no to, you know, which, which can happen to. Um, uh, one thing I thought of was, um, like, I guess the goal with this company, with iGo technology, is to reword it so we have a little more protections for the city, but at the same time, still working with them. Because um, maybe this agreement is a really small amount of money, but maybe IGO knows another technology company that wants to do business somewhere, and IGO says, oh, we've worked with the city of Bristol, and they're real easy to work with. You should call those guys. So maybe it could lead to potential something else down the road. So the goal of uh, strengthening it, the the contract, so so it protects us is, is important, but also uh, still letting them know we want to do business with them, maybe, is something I thought. You know, and has Mr. Belcher looked at this? Has uh, Rick looked at this and kind of assessed this whole thing? Um, it, Gene did. Um, so, yeah, Gene actually was here the day that they went and looked at everything, and I think Gene walked Jim got them on the roof, and so they looked at the location. So. Okay. All right, any other uh, discussion before we table? So we got a motion to table Mr. Osborne and a second by Mr. Hartley. Please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. At council on item seven, if you all wish, you can uh, table the closed session that was put on there specifically for the appointment of the Planning Commission, and we had one application. Okay, so I need a motion to table item seven. Move to table item seven. All right, get a motion, Mr. Hartley. Second. Second, Mr. Osborne. Please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mom Power? Yes. All right, item eight, consider appointment of the Planning Commission. Uh, council, as previously stated, uh, 
Kevin Corbett has applied to be a member of the Planning Commission. Uh, previously, he was on the Planning Commission, and he had to take a short hiatus from the Planning Commission. I believe it was last fall, uh, Mr. Corbett did attend some training in Withful, is that right? Um, and uh, the city did pay for training uh, that dealt with the Planning Commission, and he spent several days in Withful doing that, and I think it was a fairly long process to get certified in what he was certified in. So at this time, um, with Mr. Corbett being the only applicant for the vacant position to cover, I believe that was your post, wasn't it, Mr. Farmer? Yes. Um, I would recommend the council go ahead and approve that. Okay, has everybody seen the application? Mm -hmm. okay. Are we sure he told the truth on his age on the application? That's something that's between him and God, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of look suspicious as this one. <laughs> All right, got a mo uh, motion uh, on approval of this uh, application for the Planning Commission. I'd be happy to move to approve this. Okay, motion Mr. Osborne to approve. Second. Second, Mr. Farnham. <coughs> Any discussion? All right, please call the roll. Farnham. Yes. Hartley. Yes. Osborne. Yes. Wingard. Yes. Mumpower. Yes. All right, what's the pleasure, Council, on the consent agenda items? I have a question about the consent agenda. Uh, the very first minutes from November 6th, um, I wasn't here yet, so uh, is it similar to last time where we can pull out mm -hmm. the agenda for the minutes and yes. then vote on the consent mm -hmm. agenda separately? So, uh, okay, so we can make a motion to approve as noted yeah. to pull out November 6th minutes. Any other comments? Uh, is, are you making that motion to, to approve all items except November 6th. Well, before we make a motion, let's see if there's any oh. other changes. Is there any other issues other than that one? Okay. We're, okay. Do you want to? Yes. So I make a motion to approve with the exception of the November 6th minutes. All right. Got a motion to approve by Mr. Farnham with the exception of November 6th minutes. Do I have a second? A second. Okay. Second, Mr. Osborne. Second and third. Please call the roll. <laughs> Farnham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. Now we need a motion to uh, approve November 6 minutes. Move that we approve the minutes from the November 6 meeting. Second. Okay. Got a motion, Mr. Hartley. Second, Mr. Osborne. Please call the roll. Farnham? Abstain. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. That's, um, I guess with that we adjourn. <laughs>